Futurized goes beneath the trends to track the underlying forces of disruption in tech policy, business models, social dynamics, and the environment. I'm your host, Trunarne Unheim, futurist and author. In episode three of the podcast, the topic is the remaking of transportation. Our guest is Evangelos Simudis, technologist, investor, and author of the new book, Transportation Transformation, How Autonomous Mobility Will Fuel New Value Chains. Here we are with Futurized. Today, we are talking to Evangelos Simudis uh, on the remaking of transportation. So, Evangelos, how are you doing, given everything that's happening around us? It's interesting times. Uh, it is it is very interesting times, and uh, particularly what makes it, I think, particularly interesting is that uh, we are establishing a number of new baselines. We are establishing baseline about the future of work. Um, we are establishing a new baseline about the the role of automation in our both personal and professional lives. And um, obviously, we're also uh, going to establish new baselines about the future of mobility, how we move personally and how the, the goods uh, move around us. Yes, right. And that's what we're here to, to talk about, because uh, Dr. Simudis is, uh, you know, you're, you're an expert on, on next generation mobility, but you've also worked on technology and you, you, you're an um, uh, technologist of, of background, but you've also uh, been working in the investment world in uh, in Silicon Valley, and now I guess for around thirty years, advising uh, all kinds of uh, parties, including startups, corporations, and and governments. And uh, you're now the the co-founder of Synapse Partners, where you have an investing role. But uh, from what we were talking about earlier in the prep call, you you have had a myriad of experiences. Uh, which have prepared you for what you are now about to do, which is, uh, well, you just published a book. We'll talk about that soon. But you are getting very, very engaged now with the new mobility and the, and the new changes that are going to be needed to remake transportation. Why, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you have prepared for this moment? And then we will go into your book in a, in a second. Uh, yes. So I've been in Silicon Valley for about 30 years now. And um, the first 10 as a entrepreneur and a corporate executive and the last 20 as a as an investor to uh, early stage and growth stage uh, uh, companies. Um, in all of my career, even before coming to Silicon Valley, uh, the, the common thread has been my work with uh, data and intelligent ways of exploiting that data. And uh, all of that has come together in the firm that I have co-founded with uh, one of my partners from my previous uh, firm. Uh, so Synapse, uh, our, our firm now invests exclusively in companies in early stage startups that develop uh, enterprise software AI applications. And we also advise large corporations from um, three industries, including the automotive and transportation industry, uh, on how to both best uh, use AI and data, but also how to take advantage of uh, the innovations that startups uh, bring in, this, uh, in these areas. Well, as we're moving into talking about uh, today's topic, which is mobility and transportation, which is a fascinating area, I'm, I'm very fascinated by it. It's uh, it's changing now more rapidly, uh, one would think, than than ever before. But it is a very interesting field in that it takes a lot of skill to, I guess, innovate in, and it takes a lot of skill even just to understand and make any kind of changes. So it would seem that your background, you know, both a PhD in computer science, an engineering degree from Caltech, and like you said, having worked with a variety of stakeholders. So, but without further ado, you know, your new book is fascinating. I was uh, skimming through it this morning. Um, Transportation Transformation, How Autonomous Mobility Will Fuel New Value Chains. It's out in paperback. Um, it was out in June, actually, this, uh, this month. Congratulations. 
Well, th- thank you very much. It, um, so this is my, my second book on the topic. And uh, this one actually took uh, quite a bit longer both to, to research and uh, bring together and write uh, because it's, uh, it, it tackles uh, all the, the three major constituencies that um, will, uh, will impact the future of mobility. Uh, it talks about the, the automakers. It talks about cities and the on-demand mobility services companies and is looking at both the transportation of people as well as the movement of goods. Right. And uh, we're going to go th- uh, you know, into some of the things that you are saying in this book. But overall, I, I wanted to ask you about a, a couple of terms. And I wanted to start first with this idea about a multimodal future. Tell me, what is that about a multimodal future? It seems to be uh, a quite key construct to the entire kind of sequence of events that you are foreshadowing in this book. Yeah. So what I'm what I'm saying is today to date uh, transportation, uh, urban transportation, because the the book is about uh, urban mobility, not mobility in general. But urban mobility um, has been thought of in terms of silos. So privately owned vehicles is one silo. Uh, public transportation is another silo. Uh, and obviously on-demand mobility services is a third silo. And in, in the context of, um, of cities and metropolitan areas in general, each of these constituencies has been thinking of its own silo and it's been trying to optimize the performance of that silo. Now that has, has gotten us up to a point, but we are already starting to see, uh, many uh, strains in that, in that thinking. So you can think about the congestion in many metropolitan areas around the world, um, be it Mumbai, be it uh, Sao Paulo, uh, in Brazil, uh, be it Istanbul, um, even here in the in the United States, you think of cities like uh, Los Angeles or or uh, New York and the uh, congestion problems that they have. Um, congestion brings pollution, brings noise pollution. Um, th- there are a, a number of problems that are the results of this siloed thinking. So. The, the the book makes a couple of important uh, points. The, the first one is that we need to adopt a systems thinking in urban mobility. So we we need to be thinking of the all of these uh, modalities that uh, contribute to to the transportation of people and, and and goods as as a single system, and we need to be optimize them as a system as opposed to uh, as a silo. Uh, the, the, the second thing can you that, break down can you break down okay. just a, a second can you break down these uh, main modes for us so I, I understand systemic thinking and but that's a very advanced perspective now there's a lot of things that goes into it and you have some fairly complicated figures in your book that you know uh, certainly when they're new and these models are new are going to be a little bit tricky to fully understand so why don't you break down some of the main kind of modes just so I mean you you mentioned the modes briefly um yeah, so if you, if you what of, are some of the systemic aspects that you are concerned about here like at the very basic level yeah so so if you if you look at say public transportation there you you have a few modalities in there you have trains you have subways you have buses uh as as major modalities if you if you're thinking about on on demand mobility services you have um uh Cars again that are being used for ride hailing and, and sometimes ride sharing. Um, you have micro transit, in other words, vans and, and larger capacity, uh, vehicles larger than cars that are used for, uh, for certain routes. And then you have, uh, micro mobility, which brings two other modalities, uh, bikes and, and e-bikes as well as uh, scooters and, and e-scooters. So, so you have, so when I talk about a, a multimodal world, I, I refer to the fact that all of these modalities 
uh, under the various systems that they're, they're being used, whether it is public transportation or on-demand mobility services, will need to start being combined and, and optimized on a, uh, many, ki- many cases, either on a passenger, on an individual by individual or maybe by a seg- population segment by population segment so that we can provide not only efficient transportation, um, but uh, also a much better uh, experience to the uh, to, to, to the uh, users of, of this transportation and uh, the overall experience. Can it's not only the, the the quality, but but it's also the affordability, the safety of that experience. So that there are a number of dimensions that I articulate in the book that need to be taken into account as we uh, as we think about this next generation mobility. So it seems to me that there are clear arguments why we need a what's been called a new mobility, and we'll go into some some of that vocabulary in a second. But why is this happening now? I mean, in many other industries, and you know, this was claimed as one reason why electric vehicles took so long to get to market, and and, and certainly the automotive industry, you, you know, being heavily involved in one aspect of of this transportation. Uh, infrastructure business that we uh, that we have and invested, uh, you know, in infrastructure that's already built out. Certainly, not every actor in that system is equally incented to kind of make changes. So, why would you say that this? Because that's what I'm hearing from you in in your book and when you're speaking now that this decade, the, the decade we're going into now, that just began with with a bang, I should say is the decade that we're truly going to see a transportation transformation. Because, you know, clearly there have been other infrastructure transformations, right? The uh, influx of trains. So there, there are lots of other, and, you know, when the automobile came on the scene, obviously was uh, a, a kind of the past most immediate, you know, biggest transformation. But why would you say this decade is this moment when this enormously complex infrastructure is going to change in a fundamental way? I mean, is it a, combination of technologies and also actors realizing that there's new business models to be had? What, what is the impetus for, for this happening now? Yeah, I think, uh, as you correctly said, there's both a confluence of technologies that uh, are becoming uh, important and they're starting to, to show their, uh, uh, their uh, possibilities and their, uh, the opportunities that they open up, as well as Certain other other factors, uh, particularly within within cities, that are causing bo- both the citizenry as well as the the city leaders to to start thinking about uh, changes in the way that uh, uh, people and goods uh, are moving around. So, in terms of technologies, obviously, uh, technologies such as autonomous vehicles. Um, have brought this to uh, to the fore. Um, a lot of times, marketing, as as it often happens, um, is way ahead of the uh, capabilities of the of the technology. But uh, people have realized what are the um, what are the opportunities that uh, autonomy, vehicle autonomy, will uh, will bring to. Uh, to cities. The, the second thing is the, uh, uh, this, uh, mobile applica- the, uh, the application driven, uh, mobility, right? So you have companies like, uh, uh, ride hailing companies or micro mobility companies, um, which have made, uh, a, a very good use of uh, mobile applications, uh, in order to, to, to give choice to the consumer on how they, they move around. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, uh, in, in many places, uh, the, around the world, the, the problems that are, uh, brought up by, uh, the, the use of certain modalities, such as the, such as privately owned vehicles, um, are making, um, are, cre- are such, the problems are such that, uh, require, uh, very different thinking and very different, uh, solutions. So you have now a number of cities, uh, around the world that are starting to uh, prohibit the uh, the use of privately owned vehicles within uh, certain geofenced uh, areas. Uh, you look at uh, China and uh, which has one of the the lower um, uh, number of vehicles per thousand employees, but have 
tremendous congestion in in some of their mega cities, right? So you're and you you start to imagine how is that going to uh, evolve as if if more people were to uh, to acquire privately owned vehicles. So uh, cities are starting to they have started to realize um, that they need to to start taking very different um, uh, approaches in addressing the. Uh, the transportation problems that uh, within their within their territories. You know, it's interesting. The role of government is obviously controversial around the world, but in this particular aspect, tech uh, transportation, we don't really have a choice, do we? They they just have such a coordinating factor. There's such a coordinating factor, both on a national level and in terms of. The, the topic uh, we're talking about now, city governments and then the city as an infrastructure. What And you foresee in the book a, a quite proactive role of government at various levels in this kind of uh, evolution. And what, what's in it for them, apart from, you know, if there are quick fixes, there could be some political gain. But as we have known, uh, from many other shifts in, in society, these things will take a while. How, I guess, if you could address two parts of this question, how are government officials going to be able to understand what their uh, incentives are and, and, and get, you know, in, incented quickly enough for this massive shift to happen? And, and, and two, how are they going to get the skills uh, to make this happen, uh, these are very good, uh, uh, very very good questions. Um, so let uh, let's start. First of all, um, the one of the the book's theses is that uh, governments, city governments in particular, need to take a leadership role here. And um, when I look at um, the when I look at this topic, I, I don't focus on. Um, on U.S. only. I have taken a very uh, global uh, view and I've interviewed a number of folks around the world in order to understand various ways of thinking about the problem. And in fact, at the last chapter of the book, I talk about uh, three different scenarios that this um, uh, transformation, this transportation transformation can evolve under. And uh, I believe that each of these scenarios um, uh, is appropriate for a different geography. So it will evolve very different. In other words, this transformation will evolve very differently in the U.S. where we are uh, and remain a very uh, privately owned car centric society versus in Asia or, or in Europe. So the uh, so the cities need to to take um, uh, the initiative here. They need to take the leadership role. This, the second point is that um, uh, even though we want to be thinking in short term, this kind of transformation is not going to be a, a two year uh, process. I'll give you two, two examples. Example number one, you look at uh, Singapore, um, they have a, um, a, a 20 year plan on how they're going to involve their city's transportation. Um, uh, example number two, even here in the United States, you know, you look at Los Angeles, and um, they, they have been voting this very uh, large uh, bond programs, transportation-related bond programs that uh, will take them to 2040. You know, again, that's 20 years, uh, 20 years out. Uh, cities in Europe, like Berlin, uh, they have a 15-year uh, horizon for their public transportation. So again, the, the point is that this is not a, a two-year project. Uh, this this is a much longer term horizon, and uh, cities need to understand that. Um, at the end of the day, the is as, as we're shifting, what is what's in for the cities is that they need to be thinking about how they're going to capitalize on on these new uh, modalities that are emerging. I mean, uh, when you saw with the on-demand mobility services, whether it is um, ride-hailing, ride-sharing, micro-mobility, um, the cities were caught by surprise because these companies um, you know, expanded within uh, around the world, within the, the cityscapes, uh, w- without thinking what will be the impact, the negative impact of their 
of their actions, in addition to, to the, whatever positive they, they bring in. So but isn't so that an example of how governments or indeed anybody watching a new business model unfold really has a hard time envisioning what that business model entails? I mean, talking about business model is, is interesting in this regard, right? Because there has to be an incentive. What are some of the generally some of the new business models that we have seen? So cl- clearly in ride sharing, there, there's one. And, and like you said, the surprise there was there wasn't so much sharing as there was uh, riding, right? It was independent riding has nothing to do with sharing really so far. Right. And so that's one thing, you know, the other thing is it didn't really reduce transport for, you know, for, for the reason that it wasn't sharing. It actually probably increased transport because it provided much needed flexibility. So you had a bigger incentive to travel and you, you, you know, people were taking more, more trips what are some of the emerging business models? And, you know, maybe we can broaden beyond government, but what are some of the business models that you see in this new landscape? And, you know, we can broaden our conversation to, to include what we started with, you know, the automakers. I'm, I'm really concerned about those because they, I mean, certainly they're a linchpin in the personal sort of automobile car, car system, um, but they also increasingly are taking part of this new mobility system. So they are taking stakes in, in this new environment as well, probably because some of them are realizing they're becoming more mobility companies, but that also means that they probably bring some legacy thinking with them. What are some of your observations on very concrete business models you see emerging and that have to emerge for, yeah. for governments and, and these vested actors that obviously want to earn money also in the future? So uh, with regards to governments um, specifically, and then we'll move to the other actors, but with regards to the governments, they're starting to realize that they will have to, to monetize their infrastructure a lot better. And uh, particularly as if people are to start uh, driving less and using more of these uh, mobility services. So that means that the cities may, may lose uh, parking revenue may lose uh, traffic uh, violation uh, revenue uh, may may lose uh, tax revenue from from owning and uh, uh, from from uh, uh, using vehicles in other words from gas and, and the like so uh, they will need to uh, they will need to start better so cities will need to start monetizing their infrastructures uh, better now the, there are three aspects of the infrastructure there is the uh, the roads. Uh, so I, I think we will get to a point where uh, cities will need to start pricing use of a road uh, by these services, uh, e- even in a very variable way by whether it is by time of day or by um, uh, location within a city so that uh, high um, uh, roads that are of high in high demand, uh, they will be priced differently than roads that are that don't have as high demand. Uh, the second uh, aspect, the, the second piece of uh, that can be monetized of, of uh, transportation infrastructure is the curb. Uh, so whether it is to pick up or drop of passengers, whether it is to pick up or drop of packages and, and other goods, uh, the curb is becoming uh, an important um, uh, an important component of, of that infrastructure that today uh, it has not been uh, monetized or very has been monetized uh, very rarely. And then the final thing is uh, the final piece is the is the sidewalk. Um, so what what we will start seeing is uh, cities reconfiguring uh, their existing transportation infrastructures. You're already starting to see that even during this. Uh, pandemic, uh, time of the pandemic where a uh, number of cities are starting to, to create, uh, bicycle lanes. They're starting to, to take, uh, some of their infrastructure that is devoted to, to, uh, uh, cars and other type of vehicles and, and moving them to pedestrians and, um, uh, bicycles and, and, uh, scooters. Um, and, and you will see, as I said, this, uh, this monetization, I think the the data will play a very important role here because even though they will not be monetizing uh, the data directly, they will be using cities. They will be using data 
that they collect from their own infrastructures as, the way, as well as from the users of that uh, infrastructure in order to optimize pricing and in order to, to uh, appropriately uh, price the, the use of this, uh, of this infrastructure. So I see this type of models uh, starting to emerge. Um, I also see uh, the, uh, the development of uh, uh, more software related platforms that, uh, that will provide, uh, that provide information in order again to optimize the overall, uh, mobility within a, within a metropolitan area. So, so all these, uh, all these are going to be brand new. Now, going back to an earlier question that you made, you're absolutely right that the, the cities will need to, to start developing skill sets. Uh, in order to both understand uh, the implications and capabilities of these newer technologies, as well as to properly monetize the, uh, the, the outcomes that these technologies offer for them. And um, I, I think that and, and we're, we're starting to see this, uh, cities will need to start balancing um, what, how trans, where transform, transportation fits in their overall set of, of initiatives, uh, that they have for them and demands that they have for their other resources. Um, but I, I think we're, we're, because of what I said earlier, uh, to, to an earlier question, uh, because we're establishing these new baselines, I think now is the time for, um, for cities to to be thinking about this, and as I said before, taking the initiative in in driving these decisions. Sure, uh, the new baseline. I like that. I like that phrase. I'm glad we got to the post COVID transportation pattern because, I mean, a lot of people have all these uh, announcements about what they are very sure about when it comes to future work. We won't be commuting anymore. We won't be doing this or that. But is there anything that set in stone about how, you know, what the right answer is at this moment in time to a pandemic? I mean, let's just say, uh, and I don't know, you know, what your sort of foresight is on this pandemic, but let's just say that this is a, it's, you know, it's a medium serious pandemic. This thing is not going to go away. It's going to impact us for a few years ahead. If that's the case. What does that have for impact on transportation? And then, you know, let's take like a more drastic scenario. Let's say that this pandemic actually evolves and goes out of control a little bit like it is seeming to do now in in the United States and and in some other countries. What would that then also impact on the uh, on the uh, transportation infrastructure? I mean, essentially, is it a accelerant or is it a retardant on some of the things you talk about in its in your book that could be the first question I, I'm interested. Okay. Um, well, again, I I think that uh, it is very difficult to to make predictions. In um, as I say to the the CEOs of these large corporations, uh, my firm advises, it is very difficult to make predictions uh, while the knife is falling. Okay, and and we still have not reached. A, a steady state, what's going to be the new steady state. Um, so obviously, uh, in the short term, um, transportation is being impacted, uh, whether it is because of, uh, because of the unemployment, uh, which is uh, staggering around the world, uh, whether it is because of the shelter in place, uh, orders that uh, many uh, uh, cities and countries have uh, have instituted. Um, so, um, and you have companies that are now uh, talking about uh, most of their employees working from from home. Well, I think that again, these are in, in the short term. We will have to uh, abide by these uh, uh, measures uh, until we have a vaccine. We have a vaccine that has the, the right efficacy, and um, we can we can start thinking of our life like in a, a post pandemic um, uh, world, right? And, and that will take at least eighteen months. I, I do not expect that this will be. Uh, 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 the, what, that's going to happen in the next two months, let's see. Um, after that, uh, I think that many corporations uh, and organizations, uh, including cities, uh, will have to, to start determining 
um, how they will deal with their with their employees, how much they will uh, they will require their employees to be in the office. If if what is the form of the office, where our office is going to be um, established, and that obviously is going to impact um, uh, transportation uh, patterns. Uh, even further out, uh, and I think this started even pre-pandemic. Uh, there is a lot of thinking about what is the, the, the right designs for cities, right? And because uh, while we have, whether it is here in the U.S. or in Europe or, or in Asia, um, cities with hundreds of years of history and, and structure, in, in many parts of the world, we're building new cities or we're building new satellite cities within, within larger metropolitan areas. And, and I think uh, both the the lessons of the last five six years with regards to our uh, to, to the evolving transportation, primarily because of the introduction of on demand mobility services, but more recently because of what we're seeing with the with the pandemic, these these plans are going to to change. So I think you will see, for example. Um, uh, whether it is satellite cities or, or, or suburbs or, or uh, other city centers becoming far more self-sufficient and not requiring the transportation of very large distances uh, of their of, of the population uh, by the population. Well, that's um, a, it's a great point, right? Because I think for so long one assumes that in public transportation it's all about mass transportation, and for for you know for simple reason, right? In the industrial paradigm, it's it's all about uh, efficiency and you know m- moving a lot of people in in and out of the city as efficiently as possible. But what what you're talking about now potentially, you know, is, is the need for a completely new transportation paradigm that actually fits with this idea of personalization and flexibility that we all want from many other aspects of our lives. But is it feasible in a short term, and by short term in this context, I mean in, a, in the next decade, so in the next 10 years, that we actually can make tangible progress? And I'm sure there will be some cities, and you mentioned Berlin, Singapore, Maybe LA, although you know I have my doubts as you know uh, it, whether that city is in the same category as as those other two when it comes to an efficient sort of city planning. But po- is it possible within a decade, at least in some key cities in in industrial nations that have advanced technology, have money to spend, and have consumers that are willing to to make these changes? Is it foreseeable that some of this could be done faster? Or are we all going to be on kind of one track? I mean, do you see like a one, two, three, four track uh, path here with, you know, with yeah. leaders and laggards? Or, yeah. or does this all kind of have to happen at the same time? No, uh, there, there's no way that uh, this is going to happen at the same time. I mean, in fact, in all of the three constituencies uh, that, that I refer to in the book, you know, cities, mobility services, companies and automakers, uh, I talk about the various categories that will that will emerge. I think in the case of cities, it will be important for these um, uh, thought leaders, I will call them, uh, to to demonstrate that uh, this multimodal uh, transportation that that combines uh, not only a variety of public transportation modality, but more importantly, brings together and optimizes the various means of transporting goods and people um, can can work well. Uh, and I think, as, as we've been saying, there are a number of cities around the world uh, that have the potential to show that leadership. They have uh, they have the thought leaders within their uh, their staff. They uh, they have the support of their citizens and they have the uh, financial uh, capabilities to implement such plans. I think then you will have once once you start seeing these results. I think you will have a much stronger interest from uh, a, a second wave of cities to to adopt this. And I'll actually give you a, a simple example that's happening even here in the U.S. So um, earlier in the month, um, we we've had the announcement that the city of Marin here north of San Francisco and Uber 
um, have partner where uh, in, in in order to provide a more combined transportation between public transportation and, and the on-demand uh, ride-hailing services that uh, Uber provides. And in fact, Uber um, license its software to the city of Marin uh, in order to for the city to be able to coordinate uh, transportation better. As it turns out, here in the United States, there are about 120 cities that are considering now for the first time how to partner with on-demand mobility services companies that are operating within their territory uh, in order to provide better transportation by combining their public transportation resources with the on-demand uh, uh, mobility resources that these, uh, these services uh, that makes a lot of sense. offer. Yeah. So yeah, again, to, makes a lot to me, this is a step in the right direction. Uh, the and we need to see more of that. Now, a year ago, I don't think we could have even fathomed that 120 cities in the U.S. would have um, would have been working towards that uh, that type of collaboration. Uh, but but today we're, we're seeing that. And I, again, there has to be this. Um, small wins that lead to, to bigger uh, transformations. So let me ask you this. We have talked about uh, a lot of different types of innovation, but in the startup space, and you know, you invest in startups, what, what are some of the more exciting startups in uh, mobility right now? That so I think, I think you will need to um, look at, um, uh, in a sense, three types of startups that are uh, creating uh, exciting um, uh, products for new mobility. Uh, th there is a set of startups that are creating new vehicle architectures. You know, uh, so you have companies like Rivian, for example, which is not exactly an early stage startup. He has uh, raised a couple of billion dollars in in uh, capital. Um, uh, or, or canoe, right? Which is again provides a, another vehicle architecture more for, um, micro transit. Then the, 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 the next group of, of startups creates, um, technologies for that, that enable autonomous mobility. So if you look at companies like Aurora or Neuro or Too Simple, I mean, these are um, well-established private companies that are creating some uh, very exciting um, uh, technologies for either autonomous uh, vehicles for passenger transportation or for, uh, for goods delivery. And then the third category of startups are all the startups that create uh, software, either uh, software infrastructure that make autonomous mo uh, mobility possible whether it is simulation, whether it is data management, uh, but also the startups that deal with the overall uh, fleet management and fleet optimization. So companies like RideCell, uh, for example, or Best Mile. Uh, so these are uh, one of the thesis of my book is that uh, next generation mobility will be fleet based. I mean, so we'll have these large uh, fleets of, of vehicles. Uh, uh, very much like what you're seeing today with Waymo, uh, as an example, that will be, that will be moving, uh, passengers or, or goods. So, so to me, these are three categories of private companies, uh, some of them more, uh, farther ahead than others that, um, uh, that make next generation mobility very, very exciting. Let me ask you a little about, I mean, some of those startups are known, others uh, perhaps less known to uh, my listeners. But let me ask you this a little bit beyond the uh, individual actors. I would say before COVID, we were all kind of on this bandwagon that asset ownership, whether it was transportation or certainly any other innovation category, wasn't so important anymore. Would you say that even your vision for a fleet-based uh, kind of transportation landscape is owning the asset going to be crucial in order to organize it, or can this be handled by standards, by agreements, by partnerships? In other words, are we going to see government, you know, take ownership in a massive amount of vehicles, or are there going to be these monopoly players like the, uh, you know, a, is there going to be a GM for the city of 
uh, Boston that's going to just own all the vehicles or an Uber type player that's going to own all these vehicles? Or, or is it going to be more, uh, you know, owned by the drivers or, you know, in, in some cases there won't be drivers, obviously, but uh, how, how is the ownership going to play out in these fleets? Or, sure. or is that not determined? Um, uh, uh, my my prediction is and again. This is you mentioned earlier about the airline analogies uh, and models. So I spent quite a bit of time interviewing airline executives, and um, the the airline and the car rental uh, industry model could could be good uh, exemplars uh, going forward. Meaning. Uh, this in these industries, companies own a, a portion of the vehicles they operate, and they uh, finance, they lease uh, other uh, a, a larger portion of their of their fleets. And there are corporations that are that specialize in the uh, in the financing and then the pre configuration of various fleets that's done in the airline industry is also done in the in the car uh, in the car rental industry so i i think that um it, it is not necessary for the it will not be necessary for the companies that offer the transportation services to also own the um the vehicles they may own a small percent of the vehicles they they operate the second point to make is that um, this this fleet-based mobility that I described in the book, and as I say in the book, is, is not going to be for every city and for every part of the city. You you may have a part of the city where you have hybrid models that combine this this fleet-based uh, operated uh, mobility with a uh, with, with the, uh, the 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 model the right the, the right coordination model, as I call it. That companies like Uber and and Lyft and Didi and others are uh, using today, where uh, they they use other people's vehicles in order to provide a, a transportation service. So uh, we'll, we'll see a, a variety of these of these models um, uh, emerge uh, as we as we go forward. I don't expect that we will have in in one in a city a, a single. Um, fleet operator. But on the other extent, I also believe, like we're starting to already see, that we will have a, a very small number of, of, uh, fleet operators and, and, and transportation providers. Uh, some of them may be led by uh, automakers. Some of them may be led by mobility services companies. Uh, increasingly, given more recent moves by by automakers, I um, I see that possibility uh, decreasing. So, in other words, uh, I, I see uh, less and less the potential of automakers actually operating fleets of uh, mobility services vehicles. Um, I, I see more more likely the. Um, uh, mobility services companies like like Uber, uh, like Lyft, like Didi, like Grab, um, as being the operators of these multimodal uh, fleets. And again, as we're also seeing uh, recently, I see these companies evolving to offer not only passenger transportation but also goods delivery. Fascinating! Fascinating. I think we're uh, heading for a very interesting future. This is a massive area requiring definitely a lot of thinking, a lot of new innovation, a lot of new players are going to be here. And uh, maybe lastly, uh, I'm going to ask you this. How is it possible to track this? I mean, obviously, they're going to listen to this podcast. They're going to read your book. Uh, but how does one really capture all of the possibilities and, and capture all the innovation in this space. Have you found any one source or how do you even stay up to date on all of this? I mean, I imagine there was an enormous amount of work and interviews going into your book, but you know, now the book is over. I, I mean, you can call those people up again, I guess, but uh, it, it's a lot of work to, to, to just even track the, uh, the emerging activity. Yeah. It has been uh, a tremendous amount of work uh, for for this book uh, because of the scope uh, that I wanted to uh, to cover 
Um, we've looked at with, with my research team, uh, we've looked at about uh, 7,000 different sources um, uh, of uh, references, you know, for, um, to, to determine which ones have something worth um, uh, quoting. Uh, and, and the, the book is, is, uh, the bibliography is actually quite, uh, extensive. Uh, I think you, uh, you, we've been looking at, uh, essentially three types of, of resources. There are a number of, um, uh, technical research papers that are coming up from, uh, organizations, universities, uh, corporations that, that, that have, uh, cities that, that have, a, a very, um, uh, that, that done uh, work in this area for, for some time and they have a body of, of work to present. Uh, there's obviously a lot of, uh, blogs and, uh, uh more, uh, in, uh, more trade related, uh, articles, uh, that, uh, many of them provide interesting thinking and interesting I- information. Um, and, uh, we end up, you know, reading a lot in addition to talking to a lot of people. And, um, I think I've been, you know, over the past, uh, five years or so that I've been researching and investing and, and advising and, uh, working in this, uh, space of, of data and new mobility and, uh, software and new mobility. Um, uh, I've created a, a network of, of folks and a team that um, has become very efficient in uh, both understanding uh, what what is happening, but also being able to filter out uh, information and data that is uh, either not very relevant or not very uh, strong. Well, I thank you, uh, Evangelos Simodis, for having shared your wisdom and what you've discovered so far. You have just listened to episode three of the Futurized podcast with host Trunar Nuenheim. The topic was the remaking of transportation. Our guest was Evangelos Simudis, technologist, investor, and author of the new book Transportation Transformation, How Autonomous Mobility Will Fuel New Value Chains. My takeaway is that new mobility will unfold over the next 20 years in different speeds depending on the savvy of city governments. The future is multimodal in various ways, but will demand coming up with and embracing new business models, whether you are involved with public transport, the automotive industry, or ride-sharing startups. Finally, we are establishing new baselines for the future of work, the role of automation in our lives, and for the future of mobility. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, subscribe at futurized.co or in your preferred podcast player. Futurized, preparing you to deal with disruption.